message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello, and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on some rural community access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them, I say, as always, thank you. Or you're watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. First, though, I'm going to give you my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office, the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. And it really doesn't come as a surprise to me, especially given that summer is now officially in swing. Actually, summer doesn't begin for another two days officially, but... A lot of kids are out of school by now, so it doesn't come as any surprise that the number one movie at the box office right now is Incredibles 2. It earned $182.7 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Internationally, it grossed actually a little bit more than that. I'm actually surprised that it didn't gross more. It grossed $235.8 million, and that is all against a budget in its first week of $200 million. So here in the States, it is a tentative hit. Around the world, excuse me, here in the States, it's not a hit. Around the world, it is a tentative hit, but it's off to an incredibly, no pun intended, good start. Ocean's 8 was number one at the box office last week. This weekend, it is number two, just sliding slightly, having grossed $19 million, about $160 million less than The Incredibles 2, but eh, that's to be expected, especially given that Incredibles 2 had a wider appeal. But Ocean's 8 is still doing well, against a budget of $70 million. It has so far grossed $78.6 million at the U.S. box office and $115.4 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. The movie Tag is the second highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is number three at the box office, having grossed $14.9 million at the U.S. box office this weekend alone and $16.4 million worldwide, and that is against a budget of $28 million. So it's not a hit yet here, either in the States or around the world, but it's off to a pretty good start so far. Solo, A Star Wars Story, is number four at the box office this weekend, sliding from number two last week, having grossed just this weekend in the United States $10 million even. Against a budget of $275 million, Solo, A Star Wars Story is still struggling despite decent reviews. So against a budget of $275 million, Solo, A Star Wars Story has so far grossed $193.8 million here in the States and $340.9 million worldwide. So despite in its four weeks in release having never left the top five, Solo A Star Wars Story is still not a hit yet here in the States. Around the world, it is a tentative hit. Will it do better? It could, but it will take a while. Deadpool 2 is number five this week, sliding from number three last week, having grossed $8.7 million in its fifth week in release. Against a budget of $110 million, Deadpool 2 has so far grossed $294.6 million here in the States and $689.7 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Superfly, the remake of the Blaxploitation film, is number six in the box office this weekend, but is the third highest grossing debut movie of the week, having grossed $6.9 million in its first weekend in, in the States. Actually, it opened on June 13th, officially, which was last Wednesday, but a bulk of its money it made this weekend. Against a budget of $16 million, though, Superfly has so far made $9 million. So it's not a hit yet here in the States, but it's off to a pretty good start. Around the world, I do not have the international numbers for you. Hereditary is a movie that I'm hearing a lot of word-of-mouth buzz about, but apparently that word-of-mouth buzz is not 
reciprocal to the box office numbers so far. Last week it was number four, this week it slid to number seven, having grossed $6.9 million at the U.S. box office. But against a budget of $10 million, Hereditary has so far grossed $27 million here in the States and $30.7 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. However, that being said, while I let my personal opinion bleed in here, Hereditary is a great horror movie. I've, uh, it's not only the best horror film of the year, it may be the best horror film of the decade and possibly the best horror film of the century. So I would hate to see this movie fade into obscurity. Yes, it grossed more than twice as much as it cost to make. That's good. But I feel like more people, especially more horror fans, should see this film. In addition to that, I would love to see Hereditary gross more than other throwaway horror films of the last year, like Truth or Dare, for instance. It's not there yet, but it's on its way, and I really hope it gets there. Avengers Infinity War should go without saying that this movie is definitely a certified hit around the world, possibly a certified hit here in the States, and here's why. This weekend it only grossed $5.4 million, but against a budget ranging from $316 to $400 million, it has grossed $664.3 million so far here in the States, and an astonishing $2.02 billion dollars worldwide. So it has outgrossed Black Panther so far worldwide. I haven't checked the the United States numbers for Black Panther, but I'm pretty sure that Avengers Infinity War has beaten that as well. I guess that's to be expected, but then again, Avengers Infinity, or rather, Black Panther set the bar pretty high for Avengers Infinity War, and Avengers Infinity War has seemed to have catapulted over that bar ever so slightly. Adrift, the movie starring Shailene Woodley, is still kind of struggling here. It is number nine at the box office, sliding from number six last week, having grossed just $2.2 million here in the States. Against a budget of $35 million, which isn't a lot, Adrift has so far grossed $26.9 million here in the States and $28.4 million worldwide, which means it's neither a hit here in the States or around the world. It may reach the 35 mark, but chances are we probably won't see it in the top 10 to meet that goal. But it, it doesn't look like it's a particularly big hit, but at least it's on its way to making some of its money back. And finally, Book Club is a movie that has been well established. It hasn't pulled in the same numbers as either Deadpool 2 or especially Avengers Infinity War, but it's not expected to do so either. It grossed eight, excuse me, $1.8 million here at the U.S. box office this weekend, but against a budget of $10 million, it has so far grossed $62 million even here in the States and $68.3 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. I wasn't prepared to be a caregiver to mom. I had no idea how hard it would be and what I would need to know. Things I never thought of, like how to improve her mood and ways for me to stay positive. Luckily, I found the Caregiving Resource Center from AARP. It had articles about the basics, but also information about the hurdles I was facing. Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org caregiving. Articles, tips, and tools to help you both care for your loved one and care for yourself. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Greetings and welcome to the beautiful me club. Boston Free Radio is where you will find a variety of hosts that will entertain you throughout the week. But join What's the Word Radio every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. DJ Armador, Lady Scorpia, DJ Spriggs, and Jono are here to Greetings bring the latest greatest real news to you as well as great music welcome back to words on film the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures i'm your host and movie critic dan burke and the first movie i'm going to be reviewing for you is incredibles 2 this is the long 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 awaited sequel to the 2004 film, The Incredibles, which was written and directed by Brad Bird. And the good news is that not only is a lot of the same voice cast, Craig T. Nelson, Holly Hunter, Sarah Vowell, and several other voice actors back here for the sequel, even though it's 14 years later, or at least since they made the sequel, Brad Bird is back to write and direct. And Brad Bird's been up to actually quite a bit since directing The Incredibles. He directed Ratatouille and one other Pixar film that I can't recall, or at least 
I, I don't think I can recall. He also directed the Mission Impossible, the fourth Mission Impossible movie, Ghost Protocol. And unfortunately, he also directed Tomorrowland, which should have been a better movie than it ultimately was. It wasn't a hit at the box office. I didn't think it was terrible, but it certainly could have used some improvement. But now Brad Bird is back in to probably what he does best, which is directing and writing animated films. And hopefully that doesn't come off as patronizing because Incredibles 2 is incredible in a lot of ways. So even though the movie has come out 14 years or maybe 13 and a half years after the original Incredibles movie, it takes place almost immediately after where the original film took off. In other words... The Incredibles are now a team of superheroes. In other words, the whole family is in on the crime fighting. But what hasn't changed from the original film is that superheroes are still illegal, despite the fact that the Incredibles are, that are the only ones that can take on such diabolical supervillains as the Underminer, who is this mutant mole man who's voiced by John Ratzenberger. Well... As the, as the movie actually starts, it, as I said, it starts exactly where the first Incredibles movie takes off. And even though Mr. and Mrs. Incredible, that is Bob Parr and Elastigirl Helen Parr, who are voiced by Craig T. Nelson and Holly Hunter respectively, have stopped Mole Man from wreaking as much havoc on their beloved city as they should have, the superheroes, including Frozone, who's voiced by Samuel L. Jackson, are still reprimanded by the government and pushed right back underground. However, it's because of a couple of philanthropists who seem to be well-meaning, including Winston Dever, who's played by Bob Odenkirk, and her, his more jaded sister, Evelyn Dever, played by Catherine Keener, that they want to make superheroes... <laughs> want to bring superheroes back again. I, I can't remember the exact terminology that Bob Odenkirk's character, Winston Deaver, said. I think he, he said, make America super again. And, yeah, whenever I hear anybody making something something again, I just wince because it, it might seem like that's a... <laughs> That's a tagline for a supervillain, especially given the day and age in which we, in which we live. But anyway, the conflict begins... <laughs> Not only when a diabolical superhero by the name of uh, I oh shoot this is this is embarrassing I can't quite remember the name of the superhero but he is a hacker who is getting onto people's TV screens and hypnotizing who's ever watching him so the identity of the supervillain is not known but what makes Another point of conflict in this movie is when Winston Deaver wants to have one superhero, not three, take on these villains, or th this one supercomputer villain, and he hires Elastigirl, not Mr. Incredible, to do the job. In addition to that, Frozone is also given a, a backseat. So Mr. Incredible is actually given the task of being a stay-at-home dad. And if you've seen movies like Author, Author, starring Al Pacino, or Mr. Mom, starring Michael Keaton, you kind of know how this, this stay-at-home dad thing is going to go. But it, it still creates a lot of pretty good conflict, although probably borrowed from some of those aforementioned movies. But things get really interesting when the, the younger child in the family, the baby, Jack-Jack, who's, if you're curious, is voiced by Eli Fusile, who d doesn't add a lot to, well, he just basically makes baby noises, but th this kid, <laughs> Eli, Eli Fusile, is probably, probably was a baby when The Incredibles came out, so for him to come, come to this project 15 years later and still voice a baby that's consistency i gotta tell you that he didn't have to do it but ultimately he did well i think it was established in the earlier film or the the first film that jack jack does have superpowers but apparently in this film 
the the family forgot that he had superpowers. Either that or didn't see it. It's been a long time since I've seen The Incredibles, so I can't quite remember. But what I loved about this film was not only the chemistry between the entire Parr family or the, the The Incredibles themselves and the way they interact with one another, and, and also the fact, bonus points, that most of the original cast came back. I think the exception is the kid who voiced Dash, not the same kid who, who did so in the original movie. They actually got another kid to voice uh, the, the middle child Dash in this one. But in any event, it, the, the animation, of course, is incredible. It, it harkens back to a lot of those early 60s programs like the original Batman, and I think that was the, the intent. While the villain left a little bit to be desired, and there was a plot twist I saw coming based on the plot twist from the original film, I was still very impressed by Incredibles 2. I loved the animation. I, I liked the story, and I certainly liked Jack-Jack, especially when you begin to see what kind of powers Jack-Jack Parr has and how he joins the Incredibles afterwards. But I thought, again, really good. Even if the... Even if the villain left a little bit to be desired, and there were some echoes, maybe that were the in the original films of the the graphic novel and later the movie Watchmen, I think I still think this is a happy Watchmen, and it gets my rating of a knockout. Not only is the voice acting really good, and the story is is still uh, the it still meets the high bar that Disney Pixar has set, but the animation is incredible. A lot of it's it. Uh, a lot of it is fast-paced, but appropriately fast-paced. Dad, this is fun. I didn't think I liked kayaking. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it, but I think it's time to head back in. Okay. Can we come back? Sure. Hey, be careful getting out of the boat. It's a kayak, Dad. <laughs> I'm going to return the kayak. Can we walk home? How about a taxi? It's a short fare from your neighborhood to your naturehood. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a neighborhood park or green space near you. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the U.S. Forest Service. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Tag. And Tag is a movie that I honestly did not have any expectations for when I first saw or when I first bought a ticket and walked into the theater. I was thinking to myself, yeah, you have guys like Ed Helms and Hannibal Buress. I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. I've seen them in other films. They are funny guys, but in movies, they're kind of hit or miss. I don't know how this movie's going to be based on its plot, based on the actors who are in it, but man, this film was so much better than I thought it was going to be. I was laughing all the way through this film. So Tag is more or less about a small group of former classmates or kids who grew up together who organize an elaborate annual game of Tag that requires some to travel all over the country. So these are adults who are playing the game Tag. And one of the proverbs that you hear uttered throughout this movie is that (laughs) men don't get old because they stop playing They stop playing because, or rather, hang on. Oh, gosh, I I can't believe I forgot this. It's men don't stop playing because they get old. There we go. They get old because they stop playing. And this is apparently a proverb that Ed Helms misattributes to Ben Franklin, first of all, but secondly, lives by as he goes, he actually makes some, I wouldn't say desperate, but very extreme ways of playing tag with some of his friends. And this is a movie that is actually, it says on the poster that it's based on a true story. It's more like inspired by a true story. It's actually based on a Wall Street Journal journal article entitled, It Takes Planning, Caution to Avoid Being It, which was written by Russell Adams. In this movie, there is a Wall Street Journal reporter who follows these these guys around, these guys being Hogan Malloy, who's played by Ed Helms. You also have Bob Callahan, who's a successful CEO, who's played by John Hamm. You have a slacker and stoner by the name of Randy Cilano, also known as Chili, who's played by Jake Johnson. You have their sarcastic friend Kevin Sable, who's played by Hannibal Buress. And you also have... (laughs) 
a guy who owns his own gym and also probably doubles as a CIA agent, probably, whose name is Jerry Pierce, and he's played by Jeremy Renner. Now, what distinguishes Jeremy Renner's character from the other characters is that he is the only member of this group who has never been tagged. And he has <laughs> probably the sixth sense, or almost the spidey sense, that's probably even stronger than when he plays Nighthawk in the Avengers movie. And interestingly enough, Jeremy Renner was not in the Avengers movie, or rather Avengers Infinity War. His his absence was explained briefly when it said that his character Hawkeye was in hiding and protecting his family. But that was spoken, not shown. I have the feeling, although I'm not entirely sure, that Jeremy Renner might have turned down Avengers Infinity War to be in this movie tag. Was it a risky move? Absolutely, but it actually might have been worth it. Plus, there's probably a Marvel Cinematic Universe movie that's coming out in the coming months or years. Maybe Ant-Man vs. the Wasp that is going to explain Jeremy Renner's character's absence from Avengers Infinity War, but then again, I'm just speculating. But either way, God, this movie was so funny. Jeremy Renner was probably more of the straight man to these guys, um, funny men, but man, the way he actually avoids being tagged, the extremes to which he goes, actually is played so straight that it becomes funny again. And in addition to that, you kind of learn about this game tag, and you would think that with these five guys who are kind of serious about playing this game tag, that there will be some sort of prize or some sort of liability to being it, but it turns out that's not the case. It's just a fun game they play in order to stay in contact. And that is actually based on a true story that you might actually see from going on YouTube and watching the story on the real guys who inspired the movie on CBS Sunday Morning's YouTube page. I actually saw that Sunday morning story when I <laughs> when I was watching CBS Sunday Morning a couple of weeks ago, but it, it's still a really fun story. And just watching these guys play tag and some of the extremes to which they go from... <laughs> from taking a job as a custodian for a company that these this that one of the other guys works at in order to get to him and, and tag him and also dressing up as an old lady to get to some other people it's just really funny and what i also liked is all five of these guys had great chemistry together they weren't being mean to one another yeah they were kind of taking extreme <laughs> precautions in order not to get tagged and be it. But other than that, these are guys who are friends and the five guys in this movie, including Jeremy Renner, who had to play it straight, looked like they were having fun. And another thing is, even though this does have some funny actors in it, like Hannibal Buress, Ed Helms, and, and Jake Johnson, these are actors and comic actors who are not known for slapstick. If anything, the aforementioned actors I mentioned are known for being uh, probably more deadpan than, than slapstick. But even John Hamm, who I wouldn't have expected to be uh, funny in this movie, was. There's one great scene where John Hamm is trying to avoid being tagged, and he takes a, a chair and he flings it out a window, expecting the window to break, but instead the chair kind of bounces off the window and comes back and hits him. I was laughing so hard during that scene. But not, not only is the slapstick really good in this movie, but I really like the fact that all the guys in this film were friends. And that the ribbing that they that they inflicted upon one another was was genuine and actually pretty heartfelt. I also really liked as a supporting actress Isla Fisher, who is not actually active in this tag game because there's an amendment to the tag game where it's no girls allowed, which is kind of juvenile, but again, what I liked about Isla Fisher's character is that even though she couldn't play tag, she still <laughs> 
served as a really enthusiastic accomplice for Ed Helms' character to whom she's married. And she and Ed Helms had great chemistry together, probably better chemistry than Ed Helms has had with other women who, with whom he's co-starred, like, for instance, Amanda Seyfried. But Tag is a movie I didn't expect to be funny. I saw it. It was hilarious, and it gets my rating of a knockout. This is a movie that I think will be a cult classic pretty soon if it's not a box office hit. Imagine if I told you that an earthquake was going to hit tomorrow right where you live. 6.5 in magnitude with aftershocks occurring twice 25 minutes apart. You'd no doubt talk with your loved ones and you'd make a plan today. It's true, I can't tell you an earthquake will happen tomorrow, but what if it does? Shouldn't you have a plan? Visit lacounty.gov slash emergency and make your emergency plan today. Don't wait, communicate. Brought to you by the Los Angeles County Office of Emergency Management, FEMA, and the Ad Council. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Ibiza. And Ibiza is, a, is an island in the Mediterranean Sea off the east coast of Spain. I actually think it's, uh, it's part of Spain. In fact, I'm almost positive it is. I've been to Spain, but I've never been to this island. But this movie actually makes me kind of want to visit that island at one point. But the movie, which is actually on Netflix, it came out on Netflix streaming on May 25th. And I did see it when it came out, but I didn't have room in this show to review it, at least yet. But it is a comedy starring Jillian Jacobs as a young American woman whose name is Harper. And she works for this company whose CEO is this ruthless woman by the name of Sarah, who's played by Michaela Watkins, who is a boss from hell. Michaela Watkins is a very funny comic actress, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to work for her. But anyway, she sends Harper on this business trip to Spain, I think to Barcelona, in order to secure this business deal. And when Harper goes on this business trip, she actually brings two of her roommates and best friends, Nikki, a dentist who's played by Vanessa Bayer, and Leia, who's a freelance writer, who's played by Phoebe Robinson. And Phoebe Robinson might be misconceived as the token black woman of this, of this group, which she is, but she also is an actress with, which, with whom I wasn't exactly familiar before, but actually somebody pointed out to me that she was she's on a a podcast a very popular podcast with Jessica Williams from the from the Daily Show which is called Two Dope Queens which I'm actually is told it, which I'm actually which I actually have been told has been made into a TV series which is now available on Prime Video. I'm very familiar with Jessica Williams. I I've seen her when she was on the Daily Show, and she was one of probably one of the Daily Show's best correspondents of all time. But I wasn't quite familiar with her. However, I'm very familiar with Jillian Jacobs and Vanessa Bayer. Jillian Jacobs, of course, has been in a lot of movies and TV shows. She's probably best known for being um, the character Britta in the cult TV show Community, which didn't do extremely well in the ratings, but maintains a cult following to this day. And she's also on another Netflix show, which I liked, which was produced by Judd Apatow, called Love. So she is not only a very pretty actress, but she's also very funny and very talented. And Vanessa Bayer is probably one of the top ten, if not top five, funniest women who have ever been regular cast members on SNL. And Ever since Vanessa Bayer left SNL, I've really been I've I've liked her so much on SNL that I've really been hoping that her post SNL career is more like Tina Fey's and Kristen Wiig's and less like Gilda Radner's or Jan Hooks or anyone else who has gone on SNL left and somewhat faded into obscurity. But either way, I liked the fact that. All three of these women go on this road trip to Spain. These are women who are in their early to mid-30s but are unmarried and still looking to have a good time. Being a guy in my mid-30s who's also kind of in the same situation, I like seeing movies that actually show 
people around my age were still not committed and still looking to have a good time. And Ibiza is definitely a movie that is a road trip film, so to speak, except they are, they're flying over to Spain. But I also like the fact that Jillian Jacobs' character knows she's in a bad job, and but also realizes the importance of her trip, but still wants to have a good time. In fact, they start off in Barcelona, and then Jillian Jacobs' character meets a charismatic DJ who's a British or Irish guy. I couldn't quite um I, I couldn't quite tell but either way he was a good guy and he certainly had his charm and he they go to the island of Ibiza because this guy is saying that th- this is where his next gig is going to be so ideally if <laughs> if Harper wants to keep her job or have the best chance of keeping her job she'd stay in Barcelona and meet the people with whom she's about to score a business deal and basically do the responsible thing. But I actually did cheer, (laughs) at least internally, when Harper says, you know what, I'm in Spain, I'm young, I don't want this guy to get away from me, screw it. Let's just go to the island of Ibiza and find this guy. I, I I was thinking to myself, you know what, it's not exactly the responsible thing to do, but... I still like that attitude. And I also really liked how the her roommates and friends, Nikki and Leia, go along with her on this journey. There, there are a number of fun things that, uh, fun and funny things that you see in this movie. And to, to say what they all are would definitely spoil the fun of this film. But even though this is a Netflix film and you could watch this basically on Netflix anytime you want on your computer, or tablet, or smartphone, I actually probably would have liked to have seen this film on the big screen. I I think that even though the three actresses are not exactly A-listers, I still think they have enough recognition or probably could gain enough recognition to be for people to see this movie and still recognize who they are. And in addition to that, just have a really good time watching these three friends, (laughs) for lack of a better term, wreak havoc in Spain. I know I certainly watched this film, which is rated TVMA, uh, which I I don't, which I think means that it wasn't released in the theaters. I'm a little confused with Netflix and which films they decide to release in the theaters and which they decide to just automatically stream, but Ibiza is a film that I also had somewhat low expectations for, but of course, with Jillian Jacobs and Vanessa Bayer alone, I expected the film to be funny, but I also didn't I didn't expect the movie to be as heartfelt as it was or even really as fun as it was. Movies that are road trip films are either hit or miss, but Ibiza, I'm happy to admit, is actually a hit. It's a movie to which I give my rating of a knockout. It's a movie that is very fun to watch. It has three very appealing female leads who have a lot of chemistry together. And Phoebe Robinson, in particular, was a really good standout. She was more than just the token black chick. In fact, I thought her performance actually reminded me a lot of Tiffany Haddish in the movie Girls Trip. And that is definitely a compliment for Phoebe Robinson, who I haven't seen other things. Whoa, long time no see. It's me, the rock t-shirt in the back of your closet. Dude, remember? You crowd surfed in me, man. But you haven't worn me in like forever. I get it, you're retired. But I still got some rock left in me. So take me to Goodwill, where I can really make a difference. Your donations to Goodwill create jobs, training programs, and education assistance for people in your community. To find your nearest donation center, go to goodwill.org. Donate stuff. Create jobs. A message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. You have been listening to Boston Free Radio! This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, 
rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Everybody, this is Sleaze Grinder, host of the Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party, the most dangerous show on television. But if your eyes are tired, guess what? Now you can listen to it. The Heavy Leather Topless Dance Party is now on Boston Free Radio Sundays at 7 p.m. Right here on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is also, like Ibiza, a Netflix original, and it's called Set It Up. And this one, unlike Ibiza, actually just came out last weekend. Of course, when I watch Netflix, uh, certain TV shows that I watch, I always see previews of Netflix films that come out. And of course, it saves me a trip to the movie theater for sure. But sometimes I, I am interested to see the variety of Netflix films that come out. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're excellent. Such is the case with movies like Mudbound, which I haven't actually reviewed on the show yet, but maybe I will. It might, it might be a little old at this point. But there are also other movies like A Christmas Prince, which I don't know why Netflix would have bothered with that one. Why didn't they just send that to Lifetime? But either way, set it up. I One of the things I, I think is mesmerizing about Netflix is, especially when it comes to their movies, you never quite know. It, it's sort of a mixed bag. You, you could... Unlike Lifetime, I think Netflix could be either a hit or a miss, but it's, it's, you never really know what to expect in terms of quality. But Set It Up is a romantic comedy, which is not my favorite genre, but I always give every movie a chance, even if I don't particularly love the genre. And even though I love a variety of genres of movies like horror, documentary, comedy, drama, you know, the list goes on. Romantic comedies are probably the ones I look the least forward to seeing. But Set It Up is not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. It's about two put-upon corporate assistants, of corporate executives' assistants, that is, who hatch a plan to matchmake their two bosses. Do they do this because they're ni nice people? Not exactly, but... One of the put-upon assistants is a young woman named Harper who's played by Zoe Deutsch. And Zoe Deutsch is an actress who is 24 years old and has so far made, probably carved a niche for herself by making a lot of movies about girls who are in college. Or rather, her roles have been girls who are in college and are, you know, in their late teens and early 20s, are very idealistic about the world. Uh, movies like Everybody Wants Some, which is probably one of 2016's most underrated films. Why Him, which is one of 2016's worst films. And she also played kind of the same role in Dirty Grandpa, which was another really bad film from 2016. But it was not her fault that the movies were bad. But it's nice to see, very much like Greta Gerwig, Zoe Deutsch play a role of somebody who's in their early to mid-20s, who's out of college, who is really struggling in the real world. And the reason that Zoe Deutsch's character, Harper, is struggling beca is because she is the a personal executive assistant to an ESPN reporter named K Kirsten, who's played by Lucy Liu. And Lucy Liu is a woman who is 49 years old and looks great, by the way. I'm not sure if she's still considered an A-lister, but she's definitely still a household name. And even though she looks great... She has a certain shrewdness that makes, and certainly a level of ice running through her veins, seemingly, that makes her believable as a very demanding boss. Maybe not as confrontational as Buddy Ackerman in Swimming with Sharks, or that was the character who was played by Kevin Spacey, or Miranda Priestly in The Devil Wears Prada, that was Meryl Streep's character, but still pretty close. 
And she also strikes up a friendship with a guy named Charlie, who's played by Glenn Powell, who also coincidentally was in the movie Everybody Wants Some with her, but they didn't share any scenes together. He was just one of the the baseball playing frat house guys in that film. But he's probably best known for playing John Glenn in the movie Hidden Figures, which came out in 2016. And unlike Everybody Wants Some, was, well, a great movie like Everybody Wants Some, but was also a movie that got the attention that it deserves. And he was really good as John Glenn in that movie. But here, the, he plays the personal assistant of a guy who is, who we're told actually is a panelist on Shark Tank, I guess, in the cinematic universe. His name is Rick, and he's played by Tay Diggs. And Tay Diggs is not a guy who I would imagine to play uh, a hard-nosed boss who gives his assistant hell. In fact, whenever I've seen Tay Diggs in a movie, whether it be How Stella Got Her Groove Back or Rent, he usually plays a nice, charismatic guy. He certainly has the charisma here, but he also knows how to play a ruthless executive who, when things don't go his way, he takes it out on on people around him. I wouldn't say he's as bad as Kevin Spacey's buddy Ackerman from Swimming with Sharks, but that's a high bar to set. But either way, Tay Diggs plays this like Kevin O'Leary trapped in Damon John's body, and I think he does a good job. Now, this movie sets these two up, Lucy Liu and Tay Diggs, as really horrible bosses, or maybe not as bad as the bosses in the movie Horrible Bosses, but still very demanding and very tiresome. But Charlie and Harper set the two up, you know, base have their work their schedules around those two meeting so that they can fall for each other. The the mistake this movie makes, however, is even though Zoe Deutsch and Zoe Deutsch, excuse me, and Glenn Powell do have chemistry together to know for, for you to know that they're eventually going to hook up. I didn't see that same kind of chemistry with Tay Diggs and Lucy Liu. In addition to that, a lot of there were some crucial love scenes that could have shown the two of them together, which they didn't. So much to the point that I thought one of the plot twists of this film was going to be that even though these two executive assistants pulled so many strings to get the two of them together and you know, having a budding romance, you never see their relationship together until probably about three quarters of the way through the film. I thought the plot twist was going to be that these two were seeing other people, and that would have been a really good plot twist other than the fact that I just thought of it. But unfortunately, there were a lot of missed opportunities in this film to actually show the two of them having chemistry together. And maybe the reason the movie didn't show them having chemistry together was because Lucy Liu and Tay Diggs, even though they play good, bad bosses, they may not have that desired chemistry that they need together that would have made this movie work a lot better. But I did like... Zoe Deutsch and Glenn Powell in their roles. So I give this movie a passing grade of a checkout because there were some parts of it that I laughed at. Again, romantic comedies are not my forte, but this film at least had a level of unpredictability that left me wanting more, yes, but it at least surprised Open me. road, here comes the Hefley family. you packed the smartphones, headphones, tablets, water snacks, cooler, sunscreen, bikes, skateboards, games, videos, sunglasses. There's no room for people in here. Just don't wimp out on the most important thing. Deep, Deep fried, fried butter, butter on, on a stick. stick. No, seatbelts. Whether it's a long haul or short trip. It's a one-one situation. Never give up until they buckle up. Visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup for more information. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is evening gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m., Boston time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Hey, 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 it's Genevieve, a.k.a. Miss Fab 617. And it's your girl, Crystal, a.k.a. The Crystal Lens. We're coming to you from our new show called Boston Boston Come Through. Through. We'll be bringing you the latest and greatest things happening in and around Boston. We'll be talking what? Black-owned businesses, social events, what? And the black experience. How's that sound, Genevieve? I love it. Dig it. 
Tune in every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio. Boston, come through. Come listen. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is a documentary called Film Worker. And this is for anyone who is a fan or is curious about Stanley Kubrick. It is the true story, of course, because it's a documentary, about Leon Vitale. And Leon Vitale is a, is a man who started out as an actor and ultimately got his big break in movies when he played the role of Lord Bullington, the very spoiled <laughs> stepson of the of the titular character, but one who is absolutely right about the titular character and his intentions when marrying his mother. And Leon Vitale should have been nominated for an Academy Award for Barry Lyndon, but Barry Lyndon is one of the films that is probably the most overlooked of Stanley Kubrick's. It came out between A Clockwork Orange in 1971 and The Shining in 1980, both of which are not only very well-revered films, but also have a cult following. And Barry Lyndon is a movie that did well critically and actually won four Oscars, but it was not a hit at the box office. The It was nominated for Best Picture... Best Director, Stanley Kubrick. Best Adapted Screenplay, again, Stanley Kubrick. But it won for Best Cinematography, Best Art Direction and Set Direction, Best Costume Design, and Best Original Score. And if you actually watch the the film, you will see that it was very deserving of those Oscars. But the, the movie... It, even though it didn't do well, it's it's still a, a, a good piece of Stanley Kubrick's repertoire. But what's interesting is that the actor Leon Vitale could have gone on to a career of fame and fortune with his acting career. Instead, he made an unorthodox decision to toil in, ex, in obscurity working as a personal assistant for Stanley Kubrick. Usually the story goes is that when... When somebody is, when somebody gets into filmmaking or gets out of college and maybe moves to L.A., Stanley Kubrick didn't live in L.A. throughout a majority of his career. But just saying, if, if you if you work as a personal assistant for such a creative and mercurial genius like Stanley Kubrick, you would think that that would lead to other things. But instead, Leon Vitale worked backwards. In, in a sense, because he had the opportunity to work for a film genius, and that's exactly what he did. However, that occupation as a film worker, hence the title of this documentary, came with a little bit of a price. And I've seen a few documentaries about Stanley Kubrick. One of them was is actually one on Netflix called S's for Stanley, which was about another one of... Stanley Kubrick's personal assistance, but one that wasn't as probably visibly recognizable as Leon Vitale is. But th even though that documentary was good, this one was better, particularly because not only did it tell a, a story that was beyond Stanley Kubrick being particular and also very demanding of his personal assistance, it also tells the story of Mr. Vitale himself, who you know, made an unorthodox decision in his career, and it actually paid off after Stanley Kubrick died, and especially when his films from Spartacus, or he made other films before Spartacus, but the, the films for which he was known for making outside of the Hollywood system became classics, everything from Lolita to Eyes Wide Shut. And this movie has a plethora of really great interviews, including Ryan O'Neill, who was the star of Barry Lyndon, Danny Lloyd, who played Danny Torrance in The Shining. And this is a guy who has never made an interview after The Shining. After he made The Shining at a very young age, he actually retired from acting and now works as a teacher in the Midwest. The fact that they got Danny Lloyd to be in this film to be interviewed about how Leon Vitale coached him in his acting on the set of The Shining is incredible. Also, you get some... 
You, you get some revealing interviews by other stars, such as Matthew Modine and Arlie Ermey, both of whom acted in Full Metal Jacket. And what I found to be very interesting is that in Matthew Modine's and Arlie Ermey's interviews, they both said the same thing about Leon Vitale. In other words, they they said that I wouldn't do what Leon Vitale does because I'm I'm selfish that way. And what's fascinating about that is that Modine and Ermey filmed their interviews separately and probably had no contact with one another during these interviews. And by the way, j- just to get rid of the elephant in the room, Arlie Ermey is actually no longer with us. This was probably his last interview for, well, anything, let alone a documentary. He unfortunately died on April 15th of this year at the age of 74. And that's really too bad because if I were to have interviews on this show, I haven't interviewed anybody on the show yet, but I would have really loved to have interviewed Arlie Ermey because, man, he was terrifying in Full Metal Jacket. But I... I've seen him in interviews. He seems like a very down to earth guy, but man, I would not want to be, I would not want him to be my drill sergeant. That's for damn sure. And you also get a number of other interviews with other people who work for Stanley Kubrick, as well as members of Leon Vitale's family who attest to how hard uh, Leon Vitale worked for Stanley Kubrick, oftentimes working literally 20 to 22 hour days. And if you actually look at Leon Vitale now, you realize that those kind of work days, which he did seven days a week for Stanley Kubrick, even when he wasn't making movies or assisting Stanley Kubrick in making movies, took a physical toll on him. You look at him in Barry Lyndon, and then you look at him now, you can see that toll. But On the bright side, this movie does emphasize that Leon Vitale actually plays a role to this day in in preserving Stanley Kubrick's movies and adapting them for 4K digital restoration, for instance, as well as 70 millimeter prints. And Film Worker is probably one of the best documentaries I've seen this year in a year full of great documentaries, and it gets my rating of a very enthusiastic knockout. I think this is a movie that film majors should see, Stanley Kubrick fans should see, and maybe anyone who is considering making a living in Hollywood because it's not all glitz and glamour. Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've reviewed all the films that I have to review for the show, it's now time to get into my last segment of the show, which is What's Coming Up Next, a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out in theaters, unless otherwise stated, this coming weekend. And there's really one big film that's coming out this coming weekend in a... in a... (laughs) a season that is probably overwhelmed with blockbusters. But this one that's coming out is the only film coming out this weekend that's not coming out in limited release. It doesn't mean it's going to be the only film I'm going to review for you for next week's show. I still haven't seen Superfly, and I also haven't seen the movie Gotti, starring John Travolta, which didn't do well. It didn't even reach the top ten at the box office, and it's looking to be a Critical, or rather a commercial failure. Critical, I don't know, because I don't read reviews anymore, but I'll catch that one and maybe review it for you next week. But in any event, the biggest movie to come out this coming weekend is definitely Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. This movie reunites Chris Pratt with Bryce Dallas Howard, and I don't know their relationship status, but I assume, given the 
undeniable chemistry between the two in the original Jurassic World movie that came out three years ago that they are an item now. But when the island's dormant volcano begins roaring to life, Owen and Claire... Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard, respectively, mount a campaign to rescue the remaining dinosaurs from this extinction-level event. Okay, this is interesting because the plots of the last four Jurassic Park movies were that the dinosaurs were out to attack the humans, and this time the humans are trying to save the dinosaurs. I'm not sure if Michael Crichton were alive today that he would approve of this storyline, but I find it fascinating. I mean, forget all the special effects, although a movie at the magnitude of Jurassic World would probably need um, <laughs> such special effects to survive, but it, it is kind of amazing, um, the, the, the plot that this, that this movie's taken on, and also I'd love to know what the state of Jurassic World is, especially given the last movie, but... Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is actually a movie I'm seeing tonight in a sneak preview, and I will let you know what I think of the movie when I see it and when I review it for you next week. The other movies that are coming out are movies that are in limited release. The first one is Damsel. This is a movie that takes place in the Wild West circa 1870. Samuel Alabaster, an affluent pioneer, ventures across the American frontier to marry the love of his life, Penelope. As his group traverses the West, the once simple journey grows treacherous, blurring the lines between hero, villain, and damsel. This kind of sounds like Oregon Trail, the movie, but it stars Robert Pattinson and Mia Wasikowska. And uh, apparently Robert Pattinson has had a, 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 a lot of stigma because of his role in Twilight, but apparently... There was a movie that came out last year called Good Time, which I didn't actually get to see, but I did hear really good reviews of the movie. In fact, uh, it, it made the list of several critics' top ten. It made several critics' top ten lists, and it was even considered for Oscar nominations, but didn't receive any when all was said and done. But I wouldn't be against seeing this film because Robert Pattinson is in it. If anything, I think Robert Pattinson probably did the best job of the three principal Twilight um, <laughs> stars to break away from the stigma of Twilight. Although Kristen Stewart's doing a really good job too. Taylor Lautner, not so much. But Damsel, I can't guarantee whether it's coming out in the theater near me or you or not. But it's a movie I'll seek out if if it is. Another movie that's coming out in uh, limited release is one called The King, which is a documentary. It takes or 40 years after the death of Elvis Presley, a musical road trip across America in his 1963 Rolls-Royce explores how a country boy lost his authenticity and became a king, while his country lost her democracy and became an empire. Um, even though it's listed as a documentary, it says Alec Baldwin is, is starring in it. That must mean he's, he's narrating it. And you also have, I, th I think... Uh, commentary from Tony Brown, James Carville, and Chuck D. What I find interesting is that Chuck D is being interviewed, particularly because in the Public Enemy song Fight the Power, he says, Elvis was a hero to most, but he never meant <clears throat> to me. The guy was flat out racist, end quote. But the, the King looks interesting. Hopefully it's coming out of the theater near me, although I can't guarantee it. But that just about wraps up Words on Film for this week. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and the views and opinions expressed on Words on Film about movies or otherwise are solely those of yours truly, your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are working at the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. But as usual, I've had a lot of fun discussing movies with you guys, and I hope to do so next week. And I'm just here to say that until next week, this is your host and movie critic Dan Burke saying, I'll see you at the movies.